Again, it bears repeating because too often we've misunderstood. First John chapter 1, verse 8. If we say that we have no sin, we deceive ourselves, and the truth is not in us. Do you get that? Because as we're seeing ourselves, what are we seeing? The less we see to esteem in ourselves, the more shall we see to esteem in the infinite purity of Him. The only thing that I know about anyone that walks into a church and talks about their sinlessness is that they have had no interaction with Christ. They have not had a view of Him who is high and holy and lifted up. When Isaiah saw God high and lifted up in the year that King Uzziah died, he said, Woe unto me, I am undone. Right? Okay. It doesn't mean that we can't have victory over sin, because there is power in the blood. But as God is granting you that victory, that's why the Spirit of Prophecy says that those who are gaining the victory will be the last to ever talk about it. Because as they're drawing closer to Christ, they're seeing the infinite purity of God, and they're not being raised up in self-esteem. Right? When the angel, when John sees the angel, when Daniel sees the angel, how do they find themselves? How is it that we should be in prayer? On our knees, on the ground. That should be our attitude in prayer. The testimony of Jesus tells that we have been incorrectly taught to stand to pray. We should actually be on our knees before a holy God. And so as we see Jesus, we don't see ourselves high and lifted up. We see him high and lifted up, and ourselves are driven to the floor, to the ground. So if we say that we have no sin... Not that there can be victory, but if we say that we have no sin, we deceive ourselves and the truth is not in us. But if we confess our sins, then Jesus, he is faithful to forgive us our sins and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. If we say that we have not sinned, we make him a liar and his word is not in us. Right? My little children... John says, I write these things unto you. Why? That you sin not. But understand that if any man sins, we have an advocate with the Father, Jesus Christ the righteous. We have an advocate today. But we've been given the most solemn message ever given to be taken to the world, that one day the washing machine will be turned off. That as Hebrews says, there will be no more sacrifice for sins. One day we will have to live in the sight of a holy God without a mediator. We want Jesus to come, but before he comes, those robes of the priest will be taken off. And a dying world needs to understand this. We need to understand it first. Philippians chapter 2, Wherefore, my beloved, as you have always obeyed, not in my presence only, but now much more in my absence, work out your own salvation with fear and trembling. Can the pastor do it for you? Can Doug Bachelor do it for you? No. Can anyone do it for you? No, no. Can your spouse do it for you? No. Work out your own salvation with fear and trembling, but understand it is God which worketh in you both to will and to do of his good pleasure. Because where is the power? In the blood of Jesus Christ. Do all things without murmuring and disputing that you may be blameless and harmless, the sons of God, without rebuke, in the midst of a crooked and perverse nation. Is it a crooked and perverse nation? Among whom ye shine as lights in the world. Because as the darkness grows who looked up this week and saw all the beautiful stars? Ah, you didn't see all the beautiful stars this week because there was a full moon. But folks, as it gets darker, 
those twinkling lights appear to be even brighter. The dark, gross darkness is settling upon the world, Isaiah tells us, and now it says, arise. It's our time to shine when the world is in its most utter state of gross darkness. Romans chapter 8, For I consider that the sufferings of this present time are not worthy to be compared with the glory which shall be revealed in us. For the earnest expectation of the creation eagerly waits for the revealing of the sons of God. Two thousand years ago, Jesus Christ hung upon a cross. And the universe got to see the revelation of God's love. The universe finally, that's when the Bible says the devil was cast out to this earth because the heavenly agencies would no longer listen to Satan. When he came around and said, you know, are you quite, are you sure that God is really right? Because there's a different way. When they saw the love of God as revealed on the cross, the heavenly agencies were convinced they no longer listened to Satan. But the universe is still waiting now for the revealing of the sons of God because Jesus Christ must prove that there is power in the blood. Is Jesus right when he says that we love him? Why? Because he first loved us. But the Bible says that if you love him, you keep all his commandments. Do we do that? Do we love him? Is God a liar? The universe is waiting to see if, in fact, the love of God can change us. <laughs> the universe is waiting to see if, in fact, Romans 2, 4 is correct, that the goodness or grace of love of God leads to repentance, a U-turn from sin. The universe is waiting to see if Jesus was right in Titus chapter 2, whether the grace of God, when is revealed to all men, can teach us to deny ungodliness. How long shall we make them wait? Galatians chapter 5, for all the law is fulfilled in one word, even this, thou shalt love thy neighbor. How? By the way, is that one word? I'm going to leave you to go home and study that passage and understand how that's one word. We need to put on our thinking caps. Even for all the laws fulfilled in one word, even this, thou shalt love thy neighbor as thyself. One word. Go home this afternoon. Spend some time with Jesus after 2.30 Bible study and figure that out. It is one word. I'm not. To, God doesn't lie. But you, when we read the Bible, we need to think. Not just read it casually, not just listen to someone else speak it, not just read it in some lesson book and read it. You need to think. God says, Come, let us reason together. Though your sins be as scarlet, they shall be as white as snow. We need to reason with God. John chapter 13, a new commandment I give unto you. Is this a new commandment? Again, we need a reason. A new commandment I give unto you that you should love one another as I have loved you, that you also should love one another. By this shall all men know that you are my disciples if you have love one to another. The Bible says that God knows if we are his disciples, if we keep his commandments. We go to the world and we tell them that we're the people of God because we keep his commandments. But the Bible says, by this shall all men know that you are my disciples, not that you keep my commandments, although that is true, if you have love one for another, because we know if we love one another, all the law is fulfilled, we do keep his commandments. We're not the people of God because we're here on Sabbath morning. It said the world will know 
that we are God's people if we have love one for another. Simon Peter said unto him, Lord, whither goest thou? Jesus answered him, Whither I go, thou canst not follow me now, but thou shalt follow me afterwards. Peter said unto him, Lord, why can't I follow you now? I lay down my life for your sake. Do you understand why Peter couldn't follow him now? Was Peter willing that night to lay down his life for Jesus? No. Peter denied his Lord. All the disciples denied their Lord. Are you ready to follow Jesus now? Are you ready to go to heaven? Are you ready to lay down your life? Because we say that we're ready to die for him, but the truth is we don't even live for him. Does that make sense? We need to be ready to die for him, but before we can die for him, we must be ready to live for him. Patriarchs and Prophets, page 520, says, Even under false accusations, those who are in the right can afford to be calm and considerate. It's a high standard that I don't often meet. Even under false accusation, those who are in the right can afford to be calm and considerate. God is acquainted with all that is misunderstood and misinterpreted by men, and we can safely leave our case in His hands. <coughs> No one else might understand you. And that is often a very painful thing. But God understands. He will as surely vindicate the cause of those who put their trust in him as he searched out the guilt of Achan. Those who are actuated by the Spirit of Christ will possess that charity, that love, which suffers long and is kind. It is the will of God that Union and brotherly love should exist among his people. The prayer of Christ just before his crucifixion was that his disciples might be one as he is one with the Father, that the world might believe that God had sent him. Because how does the world believe? When we have love one for another. Again, we have problems loving people in the church, much less loving the people outside. We need to start at home. This most touching and wonderful prayer reaches down the ages, even to our day, for his words were, neither pray I for these alone, but for them also which shall believe on me through their word. She's quoting John 17. While we are not to sacrifice one principle of truth, okay, don't forget that, but remember more. While we are not to sacrifice one principle of truth, it should be our constant aim to reach this state of unity. This is the evidence of our discipleship. Psalms 133, Behold, how good and how pleasant it is for brethren to dwell together in you. Amen. Amen. First Peter chapter 1, chapter 3, Finally, be ye all of one mind, having compassion one of another, love as brethren, be pitiful, be courteous, not rendering evil for evil or railing for railing, but contrarywise blessing, knowing that you are thereunto called that you should inherit a blessing. For he that will love life and see good days, let him refrain his tongue from evil and his lips that they speak no guile, no deceit. Let him eschew, turn away, shun evil and do good. Let him seek peace and ensue it. For the eyes of the Lord are over the righteous, and his ears are open unto their prayers, but the face of the Lord is against them that do evil. Our memory verse this morning, 1 John chapter 3, For we know that we have passed from death to life. Is there any greater miracle? You see, 
you this is the power of God. To take those who are dead in trespasses and sins. We know that we have passed from death unto life because we love the brethren. He that loveth not his brother abides in death. Whosoever hates his brother is a murderer. <clears throat> Do you ever consider that? Do you dislike someone? No one right? Do you dislike someone's? Maybe I missed it in the question. Because if you hate your brother like Cain began in the heart, Jesus says you're a murderer. And you know that no murderer has eternal life abiding in him. Hereby perceive we the love of God because we laid down his life for us. And we ought also to lay down our lives for the brethren. And again, if, you, if you're going to die for someone, then you ought to be able to live for them. You ought to be able to help them. You ought to be able to do something. It's nothing for your wife to say, baby, I love you to death, but can't put up these cabinets. i got other things to do. Right? But whoso hath this world's good and seeth his brother have need and shutteth up his bowels of compassion from him, how dwelleth the love of God in him? My little children, let us not love in word, neither in tongue, but in deed and in truth. John chapter 3, for God so loved the world, what? <laughs> That he gave, not that he felt. For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten Son, that whosoever believeth in him, and that word believeth encompasses a lot, should not perish but have everlasting life. For God sent not his Son into the world to condemn the world, but that the world through him might be saved. The message of God's love, the message of God in one word, repent, is not to condemn us. You shall call his name Jesus, for he shall save his people from their sins. This is a message of love that would lay down his life. And as Craig likes to remind me, the person who is in a position to go and say something to someone about what that person is doing wrong is the person who is willing to lay down their life. That what's, that, that is the, that's what makes you fit to go and tell someone that they're wrong, is that you would give your life for them. Jesus could tell us, go and sin no more. Jesus could tell us very plainly our sins because Jesus was ready, willing, and did in fact give his life for me, for you, for all those that he said, go and sin no more. Amen. Matthew chapter 5 let your light so shine before men that they may see your good works and glorify your Father which is in heaven. Testimonies to Ministers, page 441. Let no one deceive his own soul in this matter. Don't be deceived. If you harbor pride, that just knocked out a lot of us, all of us. If you harbor pride, Self-esteem, the world is known to building self-esteem. If you harbor pride, self-esteem, a love for supremacy, vainglory, unholy ambition, murmuring, discontent, bitterness, evil speaking, lying, deception, slandering. You have not Christ abiding in your heart, and the evidence shows that you have the mind and character of Satan and not that of Jesus Christ, who was meek and lowly in heart. Do you understand why you need to distrust yourself more? That you might be driven to the cross, that you might be driven to Jesus Christ, who not only forgives, but has power to cleanse. You must have a Christian character that will stand. The pastor's been dealing with the seals, when all that breaks out in the sixth seal, the question John asks is, and who shall be able to stand? Who will never fall? Who will never sin? You must have a Christian character that will stand. You may have good intentions, good impulses. You may speak the truth understandingly, but you are not fit for the kingdom of heaven. Your character has a base material which destroys the value of the gold. 
You have not reached the standard. The impress of the divine is not upon you. The furnace fires would consume you. Our God is a consuming fire because you are worthless, counterfeit gold. And that is why God is saying to this church, to our church, to Laodicea, come now and buy a new gold tried in the fire. You think that you're okay, but you're blind and wretched and naked and miserable and poor. Come now, because at the midnight cry, at the passing of a Sunday law, there's five virgins are sent to go and to buy from him that sells, but it is too late then. For us sitting in this sanctuary, today is the day. Today, if you hear his voice, harden not your hearts. There must be thorough conversion among those who claim to believe the truth, or they will fall in the day of trial. The day of trial, when it's small time of trial, we will fall. God's people must reach a high standard. They must be a holy nation, a peculiar people, a chosen generation, zealous of good works. This is all quoting from the Bible. Christ has not died for you that you may possess the passions, tastes, and habits of men of the world. Grace is not the substance that allows you to continue to sin. Grace is not the substance that allows you to like what everyone likes, to like the movies, what they watch, what they listen to, what they enjoy. It's not, if it's not what Christ enjoys, God did not die for you so that you can live in sin. It is difficult to distinguish between those who serve God and those who serve Him not because there is so little difference in character between believers and unbelievers. You cannot serve God and Baal, Baal, the devil. The sons of God belong to a different nation, the empire of purity and holiness. They are the nobility of heaven. Or what? Do you know why you're created? Yes, to bring glory to God. You are created to reign on the throne of God. You see, Satan wanted to reign on the throne of God. Covered and decked in jewels, that was what caused him to fall. He was corrupted by reason of his brightness. All those jewels were reflecting the glory of God. He became and thought it was him, and he fell. He was corrupted by reason of his beauty. God made us out of dirt, and that's why I don't understand that Adventism is... I didn't understand as a young man why we didn't wear jewelry, because no one could show me from the Bible. It was just a rule, terrible, terrible thing. But even among Adventism, we are... We are covering ourselves like the devil did, making ourselves look more like him when God made us out of dirt. But when you read Revelation, to sit on his throne, God is going to take dirt that has humbled itself and become beautified and exalt us. But we're so busy exalting ourselves. We're so busy, right? I mean, Again, this church did really well. It's the first time I was involved with uh, the, the nominating committee, right? But the nominating committee, the time is the worst time to set up the Adventist church, right? People are fighting for position and trying to glory, you know, trying to get, want to be head deacon and head this and head whatever. And Jesus is scratching his head. They are the nobility. You are to be the nobility of heaven. The stamp of God is upon them. So evident and perceptive is this, that the enmity of the world is aroused against them by the contrast. I call upon everyone who claims to be a son of God never to forget this great truth, that we need the Spirit of God within us in order to reach heaven. Christ in you the hope of glory. Isaiah chapter 33, sinners in Zion are afraid. Fearfulness has surprised the hypocrites. Again, you know that word, hypocrites? That's what, that's the base word for actors. That's what actors were called, hypocrites. We love actors. We call them stars. We glorify this thing. 
That is the word hypocrites. They put on a face, they are, they are one thing, but they pretend to be something else. We glorify this stuff. Fearfulness has surprised the hypocrites. Who among us shall dwell with devouring fire? Who among us shall dwell with everlasting burnings? Our God is a consuming fire. Who? He that dwells, he that walks righteously and speaks uprightly, he that despises the game of oppression, that shakes his hands from holding of bribes, that stops his ears from hearing of blood, and shuts his eyes from seeing evil. Him who has turned off prime time. Him who hasn't seen the last great blockbuster. James 1.21, pure religion and undefiled before God and the Father is this, to visit the fatherless and the widows in their affliction and to keep himself unspotted from the world. Testimonies, volume 2, page 135, God regards more with how much love one works than the amount that he does. Jesus looked at that widow and the fact that she cast in two, two mites wasn't important. He saw the heart with which it was given. God regards more with how much love one works than the amount he doeth. Love is of God. The unconverted heart cannot originate nor produce this plant of heavenly growth, which lives and flourishes only where Christ reigns. Love cannot live without action. For God so loved that he gave his only love cannot live without action and every act increases strengthens and extends it love will gain the victory when argument and authority are powerless i need to learn this lesson in my life love will gain the victory when argument and authority are powerless love works not for profit nor reward Yet God has ordained that great gain shall be the certain result of every labor of love. It is diffusive in its nature and quiet in its operation, yet strong and mighty in its purpose to overcome great evils. It is melting and transforming in its influence, and it will take hold of the lives of the sinful and affect their hearts when every other means has proven unsuccessful. Wherever the power of intellect, of authority, or of force is employed, and love is not manifested, manifestly present, the affections and will of those whom we seek to reach assume a defensive, repelling position, and their strength of resistance is increased. Has anyone ever felt this in your home? You need to go home. This is Testimonies, Volume 2, page 135. We're studying Testimonies, Volume 2. Everything that we need for life is in these testimonies. But I need to understand it more. I need to spend more time with Jesus, with the testimony of Jesus, to let his word abide in me, that his character might shine out of me. 2 Corinthians chapter 5, For the love of God constraineth, some versions say, compels us, controls us, the love of God controls us because we thus judge that if one died for all, then we're all dead. And that he died for all, that they which live should not henceforth live for themselves, but unto him which died for them and rose again. Does the love of Christ constrain you to live for others? Does it compel you to live for others? Does it control you such that you live for others? There's nothing wrong with the love of Christ. You just haven't felt it. We're too busy loving the world and the things of the world, spending time in the things of the world. If I focus upon Jesus Christ, it is well that we should spend a thoughtful hour every day contemplating the life of Christ, especially its closing scenes, because the love of Christ the power in the blood will compel, control, constrain us to live for others. Wherefore, henceforth, know we no man after the flesh, yea, though we have known Christ after the flesh, yet now henceforth know we him no more. Therefore, if any man be in Christ, he is a new creature. Old things are passed away. Behold, 
all things are become new. Does anyone need this this morning? Amen. Testimonies, volume 9, page 59. Love for lost souls brought Christ to Calvary's cross, and love for souls will lead us to self-denial and sacrifice for the saving of that which is lost. We need to look upon this cross of Christ and see the love that he had for me so that I can have the same love for someone else. Acts of the Apostles, page 551, the completeness of Christian character. You want to be therefore perfect even as your Father which is in heaven is perfect. The completion of Christian character is attained when the impulse to help and to bless others springs constantly from within. Not I helped them yesterday and look at the mess they made of it. That's how I think. <clears throat> For now. The completeness of Christian character is attained when the impulse to help and to bless others springs constantly from within. It is the atmosphere of this love surrounding the soul of the believer that makes him a savor of life unto life and enables God to bless his work. She's quoting Paul, we should be a savor of life unto life for those who are being saved. Supreme love for God and unselfish love for one another. This is the best gift that our Heavenly Father can bestow. This love is not an impulse, but a divine principle, a permanent power. There is power in the blood. We're going to heaven for golden streets. We're not going to heaven for 90% humidity and 98 degrees, are we? No. There's a young man here from South Dakota this morning. He said he likes Texas. I thought, come back in the winter, man. You really like it. That's not the point of heaven. Perfect love. The only scars, the only trace of sin in heaven will be what? The scars in his hand. Forever. Jesus had a body like us forever. That's kind of a big deal for God. This love is not an impulse, but a design principle. It's a permanent power. The unconsecrated heart cannot originate or produce it. Only in the heart where Jesus reigns is it found. Abide in me, and I abide in you. Because if you don't abide in him, you're going to be dried up and thrown in the fire. Only as we abide in him. We love him because he first loved us. In the heart renewed by divine grace, Renewed by grace is the power to change us. In the heart renewed by divine grace, love is the ruling principle of action. It modifies the character. It governs the affections. It governs the impulses. It controls the passions. It ennobles the affections. This love, cherished in the soul, sweetens the life and sheds a refining influence on all around us. Oh, I preach to myself. You want to change a family member? look more like Jesus. Amen. Arguments will not help. I specialize in arguments. <laughs> this love cherished in the soul sweetens the life and sheds a refining influence on all around us. Matthew chapter 5 verse 48. This is what Jesus is talking about when he said, love your enemy. Be ye therefore perfect. Even as your Father which is in heaven is perfect. Christ Object Lessons, page 69. When the fruit is brought forth, immediately God puts in the sickle because the harvest is come. When the grain is ripe, people, by the way, in Matthew 5, 48, the, the brilliant scholars say the word perfect there doesn't mean perfect, it means ripe or mature. 
Again, it's the same Greek word for God as it is that he's calling us to be. But if you understand that even as be ye therefore mature or ripe, when the fruit is brought forth, when it is ripe, when it is mature, immediately God puts in the signal because the harvest has come. When the grain is turned, there, there is wheat and tears. But when the wheat is ripe, when it's ready, when it's ready, when it's perfect, when it's mature, the harvest will begin. Because the world is not going to be convinced by our arguments. The world is not going to be convinced no matter how many things we show up on the screen or how many times we bring in someone here to explain Revelation. The world is going to be convinced when the sons of God are redeemed. Not by argument, but when we love them like Christ loves us, then the final harvest can come. When the fruit is brought forth, immediately he puts in the sickle because the harvest has come, quoting Mark 4.29. Christ is waiting with longing desire. What kind of desire? Long. Longing desire for his people, for the manifestation of himself in his church, when the character of Christ shall be perfectly reproduced in his people, then he will come to claim them as his own. Do you want Jesus to come soon? It is the privilege of every Christian not only to look for, but to hasten the coming of our Lord Jesus Christ, referring to Peter chapter 3, verse 12, where all who profess his name bearing fruit to his glory. What kind of fruit? Good works. Let that then say you're made good works. How quickly the whole world would be sown with the seed of the gospel. Quickly the last great harvest would be ripened and Christ would come to gather the precious earth. Psalms chapter 24, who shall ascend into the hill of the Lord? Who shall stand in his holy place? He that has clean hands and a pure heart. He who has not lifted up his soul unto vanity. This is why I can say fashion is the thing that is most killing our church. Men and women alike. Women longing after fashion. Men looking at their fashion. Vanity must go. He who has clean hearts and a pure, uh, clean hands and a pure heart, who, he who has not lifted up his soul unto vanity nor sworn deceitfully, he shall receive the blessing from the Lord and righteousness from the God of his salvation. You see, because who, to whom can God give a new heart? Those who hate sin. God is not a rapist. He's not going to take out your heart that loves vanity, that loves vain glory, that loves position. He's not going to hold you down and rip your heart out and give you one. But if you hate your sin and you confess it, then he can forgive and cleanse it. He can give you the righteousness of God. Psalms chapter 15. Lord, who shall abide in thy tabernacle? Who shall dwell in thy holy hill? He that walks uprightly and then works righteousness. Little children, 1 John chapter 3. Don't be deceived. He that doeth righteousness is righteous. He that walks uprightly, he that worketh righteousness and speaketh the truth in his heart, he that backbiteth not with his tongue, nor doeth evil to his neighbor, nor taketh up a reproach against his neighbor, in whose eyes a vile person is condemned or despised. Do we like to again watch TV and we love to watch vile people and entertain by it? No, no. Who's going to be in God's tabernacle? Who is going to be in his holy hill? Those who despise vile people. Those who watch them. No. I don't want to be like that. He that honoreth them that fear the Lord, he that sweareth to his own hurt and changeth not, he that putteth not out his money to usury nor taketh reward against the innocent, he that doeth these things shall never be moved. Who shall be able to stand? Who shall never fall? Who shall never be moved? The instructions are given. He that is no longer loving the world, but has turned his back on the world and is facing God. I forget I had it up here. Revelation 6, verse 17. For the great day of his wrath has come. And who shall be able to stand? There's one thing that God tells us in Revelation 7 and 14. There's one reason why he can't let the day of his wrath come. There's one reason why these angels are told to hold those winds of strife. Because God's people are not yet ready to be sealed in their forehead. Do you want Jesus to come? 
Then it's first, second Peter chapter three says, then live to hasten his coming. Because how we live, when the grain is ripe, immediately God will put it in sin. John chapter 15, as the Father has loved me, so I have loved you, Jesus says. Continue in my love. If you keep my commandments, you shall abide in my love, even as I have kept my Father's commandments and abide in his love. These things have I spoken unto you, that my joy might remain in you, and that your joy may be full. This is my commandment, that you love one another as I have loved you. Greater love hath no man than this, that a man lay down his life for his friends. You are my friends, Jesus says, if you do whatever I command you. Desire of Ages, page 641. Love to man is the earthward manifestation of love to God. It was to implant this love to make us children of one family that the King of Glory became one with us. And when his parting words are fulfilled, love one another as I have loved you. When we love the world as he has loved it, not Jesus didn't love sin, did he? Was he entertained by it? Did he partake of it? Did he pay $15 to go watch it on Saturday night? Did he pay $85 to go watch it on Sunday morning? When we love the world as Jesus has loved it, then for us his mission is accomplished. We are fitted for heaven, for we have heaven in our hearts. Do we understand this? Love not the world, neither the things of the world. All that is in the world, the pride of life, the love of the flesh, it's not of the Father. When we love the world like Christ loved it, then his mission is accomplished. We are fitted for heaven because we have heaven in our hearts. This is why Jesus could look at some, even while he was saying, say, you're near the kingdom of heaven. The kingdom of heaven is in you, Jesus said. I beg, I beseech, I plead with each one of us to throw Babylon out of our hearts. Babylon is confusion. The world is confused. The world loves sin. The world loves selfishness. I beg each of us to be diligent this week to throw that out. That we may become fitted for heaven. That our family members who don't understand what we purport to believe by the love that begins to dwell in our hearts they will accept it. Not because we've convinced them by brilliant arguments and words, but by our life. We end with this from Testimony Volume 9, page 285. My brothers, my sisters, I urge you to prepare for the coming of Christ in the clouds of heaven. Day by day, cast the love of the world out of your hearts. Understand by experience what it means to have fellowship with Christ. Prepare for the judgment that when Christ shall come, to be admired in all them that believe. In whom is Christ going to be admired? In you. Christ in you, the hope of glory. Fear God and give glory to him for the hour of his judgment is come. And when judgment passes from the dead to the living, Christ must be living in you. Christ must be living in you because that's how the world is going to know that we're his disciples. That's how the world is going to see the love of Jesus Christ is going to be in your life. Prepare for the judgment that when Christ shall come to be admired in all of them that believe, you may be among those who will meet him in peace. By the way, do you see that's the reference? That's 2 Peter chapter 3, verse 14. To be diligent, to be found of him in peace. Again, I often stand before you when we talk about sin and we talk about
all the things that need to change and it's uncomfortable because no one really talks about it anymore. We just we just have a relationship with Jesus. But is it our it is our sins that have separated between us and our God, as it says very expressly. Jesus is knocking on the door of your heart. Behold, behold, I stand at the door and But he's not a thief. He won't break it down. You have to open the door of your heart. And we laugh at that innkeeper who had no room for Jesus, but the truth is, a lot of us have way too much of the world living in our hearts. There is no room for Jesus. why Jesus says to Joshua, take off the filthy robes. Take them off. And then Jesus clothes him with a beautiful robe of righteousness. Be diligent to be found in peace. Our closing hymn this morning